Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I'm your host. And today's episode is another Instagram Live Q&A. So this one is going to be the first one that we released midweek. Uh, so this episode comes out on Thursdays and I'm recording it on Sundays at 8.30pm. So I'll do hopefully do this every week. Uh, I haven't got as many questions this week, but there's some good questions. So there's, there's uh, I'll go in more in depth into some of the answers. So the first question just came in late last week from Mark from Broman's Coaching and Install Paving. He said, what's the most memorable point of your career so far? There's been uh, quite a few moments. So I reckon the, the first one that sprung to mind was in 2012 when uh, we built, it was our second year building a garden show at the Melbourne International Flower Garden Show in the Student Gardens competition. So it was when um, students would design a five by five metre garden and then because they're students, they couldn't build it themselves, so they'd get a construction company to build it through landscape in Victoria. And we built one of them. Um, and then we'd just build it, and then I'd go home. And, uh, and then uh, the next day, like so when it was all finished, they had the award ceremony. And uh, Ross, who the gang who we built for, gave me a call and said that we won, which was, I was just blown away with. Like his garden was amazing. It had like a, a velvet bed in there, and a, that was some pretty cool stuff. Unfortunately, it was. So long ago that I don't have any photos of it because phones weren't as popular back then as what they are now. But um, yeah, some really cool things in that design and that and having to build a, a garden that won gold medal was pretty cool. Uh, so that was the first thing that came to mind. And then when I think thought back further, back in uh, Install One Point when I first started out, I um got a job for a um like not quite a volume builder but a home builder doing their display home. So I thought I'd made it then. Yeah, you know, going to build a display home with all these people going to be walking through looking at the landscaping. Uh, so I was, you know, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world at the time, and then it turns out it wasn't that great. And now I wouldn't want to do a display home because they don't want to spend any money on it, which is understandable. Um, and probably apart from that, it would be when um, Zoki, my, he's been with me for over seven years when he uh, got qualified because he was the first one who'd been with me from day one as an apprentice through to getting qualified and then I've had uh, another one um, daily since then. So I've only had two in all this time. Yeah, because I'm a hard person to work for. And, um, yeah, just, and I've also had people who I started when they didn't start their first day as an apprentice. So I started when they were second or third year, but having someone go from a first year apprentice to qualified, is, uh, that's probably a highlight as well. And I'll say to them when they start, like if you're, um, if you're going to be with me until you qualify, you finish early because if you're with me that long, you'll know more than, than the average bear. So, and he had another question, which I've also seen another uh, person ask as, as a story was, what's your favorite setting on the trigger hose? So, mine is probably the jet setting, uh, followed by a shower, obviously, depending on what you're doing. Um, and then sometimes the jet gets clogged up with more because we get the seven dollar special so then you go with a center or the wave or the fan or whatever the other ones are basically anything that gets out as much water as possible but um it's leading into another question uh, I'll, I'll go to next actually um is this one is for i was going to find it out because it wasn't going to be in this order this one's from rock culture sa are you loyal to a tape measure or spirit level brand and why do you find more expensive is worth it so Similar, the reason I went to that is because with hose guns, we don't get expensive ones because they end up getting dirty anyway. So we get the five or seven dollar special from Bunnings. And that's uh, I'm the same with tape measures. I don't go the cheapest one, but I'll go the yellow Stanley. Uh, I think it's like eleven dollars now. It's probably six when I started buying it. But it's nothing too fancy because it's gonna get dirt and mud in it anyway. So there's no point going too crazy with the tape measure. I've bought ones that were fancy ones and 10 metre ones and they're good for a, a few days and then they get dirty in them or wet and mud. So yeah, there's not no point spending money on it. And the same deal with spirit levels, like we're doing paving, which is falling and the pavers aren't perfectly flat anyway. So you don't need anything that's extreme precision to a world-class level. Uh, we don't go the bottom end of the market. Um, and I've had some, tape, uh, some spirit levels where I wanted it to fall a certain direction, put a spirit level on it. It wasn't falling in that direction. So I turned the spirit level around and there it was. So sometimes 
spiral levels are a bit like that, which is not ideal, but um, it's, yeah, same deal. We go, yeah, it's probably Stanley for those. Um, not, we don't go to Lufkin, they're, they're a bit high end. If you're doing carpentry all the time, we're going to understand it, but so, like again, ours get concrete on them and mortar and glue and all sorts of stuff. So there's no, the amount, and the amount I buy, there's no point uh, wasting money on things like that if you're not going to get any value out of it. Uh, I've had a question from Lloyd Sharp. Have you got a new favourite product or material? I reckon we haven't used it a lot, but it's something I want to use a bit is um, Granite Works do a grey limestone called Pietro Ruggio. So it's got a really nice colour. Um, Renee Reader from NVIDIA Landscapes used that at a garden show last year um, in sort of battens that she put vertically. Uh, and I'll, I just love the grey on it. Um, and Eco have a similar product called Andorra. Uh, and like all the suppliers probably got a similar product with a different name, but and I'm doing my driveway in it as well using the Andorra product from Eco. Um, but yeah, it's just a really nice grey limestone. It's but it's not all the one colour, so there's there's like it's like a blue grey, the one I like. Um, so it's yeah, it's like a cool grey. I don't, don't like the brown grey as much, which I never realised there was brown grey and blue grey until I saw that there is. So yeah, that'd be one of my favourite products at the moment. In terms of paving, uh, but also like the um, the uh, pink crazy paving that you guys have been using, uh, that landscapers have been using. Uh, I have a question from Mark Hannity here as well. It's how important is using sunscreen for you and the staff when working outdoors in the summer? Obviously, critically important. Um, and yeah, put it on twice a day. Um, and it should be, yeah. It it comes down, the responsibility comes down to the employer, but really it should be, you know, have some responsibility yourself. You don't want to get sunburned, you put sunscreen on. It's not it's not rocket science and it's not something that people, the employees should be having to remind their staff about. Um, Stanbrook Outdoor Creations, I can see in the, uh, the easiest ones to read. Yeah, probably just must be talking about their tape measures as well. Uh, this one is from Ainsley 490. What's the best place to get steel edging so it, dep it depends on the whether you want to go with ease of getting it or um, efficiency in putting it in and the price um, so we use we used to use a bit of form boss edging um, that's already got a rolled edge on it it's covered with stakes and joiners already so it's a, a good diy one to use but what we use 90 percent of the time is just um, 75 by 5 mil flat bar edging so which is a a um an edging that you would need to weld in place. So put um, 12 mil bar in and then weld it to that. So it's a bit more complex putting it in. Not, it's not as DIY as what the form boss is, but probably costs, um, the form boss probably costs three times as much. And the similar, like form boss is just one example, but uh, other ones are similar in terms of DIY, where you just, they've got a kit and you can get it from a lot of hardware stores. I know resell the form boss. Um, but yeah, the the um, the mile steel to come in six meter lengths, so it's a lot. Of, it's yeah, you want to get it delivered unless you got a, a vehicle that can transport it. But uh, it goes in quicker. It's nice straight lines in it. Doesn't have a rolled edge, but you don't really need it. It's not sharp. Um, but yeah, using that, it's it's quicker, cheaper to buy. Uh, we'll go with this one. Dan Scrapes has just asked: packed lunch or tuck shop? Uh, I think all my guys bring a packed lunch um, and I don't eat during the day. So then I just stuff my face when I get home at the end of the day. Um, yeah, it's not good for the, um, what's it called? When your body's trying to process food, can't remember what that is, but it's not good for that. But yeah, you don't want to have to take off and go and buy something. We don't, we don't stop for lunch anyway, so there's no time to go and, go and do that. Uh, Ed Landscapes, who's going to be coming on, he's, I'm going to be uh, interviewing him next week, so that's going to be a pretty cool one. And that he says, what are your thoughts on the trend I'm seeing where more and more landscape companies are using more subbies? So I'll clarify this with him about whether that is subbies as in landscapers or is that just concreters and plumbers and electricians or something. But he's talking about um, using people to come, to do that. Like if, so coming in to do your concrete and coming in to do your paving. So Things that most landscapes will usually do, 
he's getting and he's hearing seeing a lot of people who are getting other people to come in and do that. Um, and I'm not I don't see a lot of it, um, but it does it makes sense. And I did have a good conversation with Steve Taylor from Cos Design about it on his episode, uh, talking about the pros and cons of using subcontractors. So obviously one of the pros is you can get through jobs quicker, whether that means you're making uh, more money or not remains to be seen, whether you're quoting it well enough. But um, the cons I was talking about with him were that you've got to rely on them to come in and do the job properly and on time when they say they're going to come. And that's the biggest issue I find with using other people. Like, that's why I do a lot of stuff ourselves because I can't stand relying on people who are unreliable to go through that experience with a roof plumber at the moment. So if, what, if one person, like it's a domino effect, if one person doesn't come when they say they're going to and you've already got other people booked in afterwards, it just... You know, creates a domino effect that pushes everyone out and, um, yeah, it ruins people's timelines. That's why I tell people I can't tell them how, when we're going to start a job because they've got no idea when everything's going to happen because we're relying on other people. And then they don't turn up when they're supposed to. And so, yeah, I, I could, if you find a reliable subcontractor that you want to use, go for it. And then if you end up, you, can, you might be able to make the same, same amount of money as them doing it as what you do. If you can put the price up to that much, they usually charge more than what you're going to charge for it, I would think. Um, but they'll also get it done quicker and you don't have to worry about it. So then you can do something else that you want to be working on. Uh, and it also depends on if you're uh, not skilled in a certain thing. Like if you can do it, but someone can do it better and quicker, then it could be good to get them in to do it as well. Um, yeah, look, so if I had someone, like if, there, if I had a concreter who said, like I'm actually some of the excavations, I'm, I'd like to find someone who can do excavations. So if I had someone who's reliable and could do that, I'd get them in every job. Same with concrete, if I finished concrete. Um, yeah, it's just, it makes it so much easier. But yeah, I haven't been able to get someone to do either of those who's reliable and doesn't swear at the client. So yeah, you wouldn't think it's too much to ask, but some, some things are a struggle for some people. Uh, Stone Age viewers ask what favorite stone type to work with. Uh, I like the uh, travertine as well. I love, yeah, just love working with it. It looks awesome as well. And there's so many different varieties to use. We've used uh, the thin stuff as well and haven't had any issues issue with it. Um, yeah, but there's nothing really, there's no stone that I, well, there's actually a stone we have aren't too keen on, my guys, especially the crazy paving. I think Eco call it Endicott. Uh, I think uh, better exteriors might call it something Alba, crazy, Alba Crazy Pay. It's like a grey granite. And unfortunately, my wife saw that's so an national out of their house, but it's it looks awesome. And it's, like, it's a beautiful colour. It's good sized pieces, but the pieces aren't flat. So, um, yeah, you just basically you've got to put up because it's kind of like a slate granite. It's got that unevenness on top. So um, you wouldn't be able to do the mitered corners like I've done with the travertine because the travertine is dead flat on top. So you can cut that in a straight line and then match it up and it'll it'll still look like that. But then but with if it's uneven, you're gonna if you do a straight line, you'll have little grooves that are missing out of it, so it wouldn't look all that great. So you can't do mitered steps with it. Um, but so it's it's not yeah, it's not easy to lay because you want to have more fall than normal because of the ups and downs of it, so that you don't have water sitting anywhere, but it does look awesome. Uh, Southern Cross Gardens has said uh, steel timber or uh, steel or timber edging. So I definitely prefer going with the steel edging because it lasts a lot longer. Uh, we did just do, we did just replace some edging in a job that I did, I reckon, oh, I think it was nine years ago, and we just put Jarrah edging in there and we went back and replaced it. So it lasted a while, but it was disintegrating. So we put steel in there. Uh, I've got Space Capture Garden Co. So Tim he said hello Joel from Tim and Jack. Hi uh, Jack and Tim. And he was also asked uh, when will my Mythicus Garden a uh, Mythicus VIP package arrive in the mail with a with a meet and greet included. So you'd be well aware of how expensive building a show garden is Tim so there's no money for any of that sort of hoo ha. Uh, Moon of Landscaping said, what's something you hate the customer's request? Mine is when they don't want grasses. So I'll clarify this with him that he was talking about like tussock grasses, 
like carrots and that sort of thing. So nothing that sprang to mind immediately, um, but I can, I can see why people don't like some of those grasses because they can look dead afterwards. Um, so that's just how some of them look uh, with their older age. But it also that's also a good thing in some gardens. So like it looks awesome when you see these dried out grasses sometimes as well, especially in a native garden. So yeah, you've got to rely on the person you're getting to design your garden that they know what they're talking about. Sure, you might, like, if you just that flat out don't want them, that's fine. There's, there are plenty of other options, and a lot of, but there's a lot of grasses to choose from, so putting a blanket ban on grasses is not ideal. Um, but, yeah, there's nothing I could think of that um, that I hate with clients. How do you word it? Uh, the, client, the customer could request. Like, everyone talks about wanting... Yeah, no maintenance or low maintenance gardens, and that's completely understandable and easy enough to do as long as you explain that it's it's low maintenance, not no maintenance. Um, but yeah, one of the questions later talk about maintenance. So, in an ideal world, you'd have someone looking after it if you can't do it yourself. But understand that, yeah, you know, not everyone's got that sort of money to spend on having a gardener come in, and you'd want to find a good gardener as well, not just someone who just mows lawns. Um, uh, Glennis Buck Designs says, "Why do you? Why did you decide to do a podcast? Great work, by the way. Thank you, Glennis. And Glennis was uh, generous enough to be one of my guests, one of the episodes, and, and she's doing some good work on the Instagram stories as well. She's very, and I've said it during the podcast, but she's very educational with what she does. So anyone who's a um, gardener and who just like gardening and design, she's well worth giving a follow because she's always giving out valuable information." And just the other day, she was showing how they had a um, an upstairs balcony garden, so they just got plants along the balcony, and didn't have a tap up there, so they they put a hose connection up there, plugged it into a tap down the bottom, and then uh, her husband rigged up a, a jig so they could turn the tap on with a big long metal rod from upstairs. So I thought that would look pretty awesome. Um, but the reason I started the podcast was because I love listening to podcasts. Um, just yeah. I hate every now and then I'll get in the car and the radio comes on. I just have to put it on a podcast or uh, YouTube music straight away just because I can't stand the radio. Just the ads and the repetitiveness of the, the you know, just jockeys talking rubbish. So, yeah, love listening to podcasts. So, like, I could never run out of ones to listen to because there's so many that I'll, I'll want to listen to. Um, so, I love listening to them. And then I wanted to hear people who I wanted. Um, like I wanted to sort of choose who I listen to, which you obviously can't do because you've only got set um, set podcasts to choose from. So that's why I decided to, I wanted to interview whoever I could. So that's why I decided to do it myself because rather than finding a, landscape, a podcast, well, it's hard enough to find a landscaping podcast, let alone one that you like, and asking them to contact the person to interview because you want to hear their story. I just thought I would do it myself. And um, in, what have we got? in four months, It'll be in May, I think it is. It'll be two years since the start of which is pretty wild to think about. So this one, this episode is uh, the first midweek one I've done, but that's going to be episode 83. Um, coming out tomorrow morning, is in Monday morning, 30th, uh, there's a chat with Mark Temkin, which is just awesome. I've had goosebumps some of the times I was talking to him. Um, so that's, yeah, that'll be it's probably one of my favourite episodes. But I've got this, yeah, I've been saying that about a lot, though. There's a lot of favorite episodes. I love, love doing it. And it's a great guest. And it's not always the people you expect. It's like the episode with uh, Emmeline Bowman from STEM Landscape Architecture. That's one of the um, my favorites because it's it's awesome to hear the way she was answering the questions. It was kind of, she's kind of talking to me, answering the questions, but also talking to the audience. So I reckon if someone was going to say, what do you think the perfect episode would be to listen to for a guest to come on, I'd recommend hers because it was. Yeah, really educational by talking to me and talking to the audience at the same time. So, it was, yeah, that was awesome. I used to do that. But, yeah, that's why I started the podcast. And, yeah, not sure how long it would go for. Um, there's, been, there's been moments where I was over it, just trying to get people on. I couldn't get anyone to come on. But, um, yeah, I've got, I think I've got five episodes. Well, I've got three episodes coming up this week that I'm going to record. Um, and then I know there's another two 
the week after. So then that so that's eight episodes I've done this year. And so yeah, so last week's or well, the like, last week's episode was a instrument Q and A because we didn't have anyone and now I've got more ahead than than what I have ever had. So that's good. So that should get us through. Was that seven weeks? I don't know when that gets us through too, but uh, if I do one of these midweek episodes every week up to the garden show, the um, the Monday after the garden show closes will be episode 100. Uh, I don't have anyone lined up for that yet, so if you think of someone who could be a good guest for episode 100, let me know. Uh, this one is from Andy at Leaf by Leaf. Do you think it's important to offer a maintenance schedule after the build slash install? So absolutely, I do. I think I've said it to, I don't know, I've said it to a few people, and I can't work can't remember what was said here recently, but uh, maintenance is one of the is the most underrated thing in a landscaping project. So there's no point spending all this like getting a design done it looks amazing, then you get the work done, like it's all built the way it's supposed to be on the design, looks amazing again, and then you just don't maintain it, um, and it just goes to crap. And, you know, the plants die and lawn dries out and like your soil goes hydrophobic and you can't bring it back it's just yeah a million things that can go wrong so it's always a lot easier to yeah just keep doing little bits and pieces to maintain it rather than trying to wait till it goes too far past being maintained and try and bring it back uh, prevention is better than the cure in that regard uh, and it was a good time for this question as well because when I spoke with Marty Sempkin uh, on this this episode coming out he he mentioned how important maintenance is and the reason why. Um, and Ian Barker said the same thing. Like, um, that's why he, Ian likes doing his own maintenance is so that he can then, um, he's got his own guys there so they can take photos of it and it looks good. His jobs never look as good as what they're going to when you first finish. That's the, one of the things I hate about landscaping is because like, I'm not very patient. When you finish your job and think, oh, this is going to look awesome in five years. Can't wait for it. So... Yeah, so he's got his maintenance team there so they get to see what it looks like. And um, and it's good for the design team as well because they can see things that work and don't work. And you can trial things in people's gardens because you're going to be keeping an eye on it. So, yeah, there's a lot of benefits for maintenance. Um, I tried it, but I tried doing it while with our construction crew doing maintenance on the side, whereas you can't. Well, you probably could do that, but it's probably not an option that people can't do that because you want to have dedicated maintenance team because the because the yeah basically you gotta use the construction skills for construction and the maintenance people for maintenance but they don't need the same skill set and they've obviously they've usually got a different passion as well of the maintenance obviously a bit more passionate for horticulture than what the construction crew might be. And you can you can yeah switch across from time to time on certain jobs and you can get them all involved but You'd want to have a dedicated maintenance team doing the maintenance, but yeah, I think it's critically important. And it's probably something I might start recommending. You may put it at the end of a quote or on the last invoice you sent through or something, just recommend a certain uh, maintenance crew. So it's good to have ones you recommend, can recommend so that you can, so because a client might not even think about it if you don't tell them. So you're the expert, so you need to tell them. So you could say, oh, to keep your garden looking good, I recommend this company to do the maintenance. And then it's up to them to work out how often they need to go out there because I've had people ask me how often they should get someone out and I wouldn't have a clue because I'm not, I don't do maintenance and never have, I'm not an expert in it. And they pretend to be. So yeah, you've got to rely on the experts for their particular role. Uh, ultimate retaining walls is asked, how do you deal with all this wet weather? Are jobs costing more time, money, lost profits? Uh, I've probably never been in a worse financial situation than I am at the moment. And that's probably, that's a fair chunk of that is due to the, the year we've just had. Um, so it's not good timing to be building a garden show, but yeah, there's just, there's, it's literally been the worst winter and year I've ever experienced in, uh, what have we got? 13 years since I took over the business. And then, yeah, it's so. Yeah, it's, 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 it's real hard. And I know that I'm not alone in that. Like every single landscaping company I've talked to talks about how hard this year's been. The year just gone. So, um, and then, and then you throw in COVID in that as well. And people were having time off. 
I can't remember who I was talking to, but there was someone, oh, um, I think it was Sam Cox who might come on hopefully. He's got some he's, uh, awesome designs and construction in natural kind of landscapes. But he was telling me how uh, first week back this year, one of his guys got COVID that week. So, yeah, here you are thinking, oh, New Year, it's going to knock up the same as last year, and then the same thing just happens again. So, yeah, so it's not like it just all stops all of a sudden. Hopefully, La Nina has stopped, I think. So it should be a bit drier. Um, but yeah, it's just been a nightmare. And it, even just one millimetre of rain will just turn into mud. So then there's an hour and a half of cleaning up the driveway. And yeah, I hate rain with a passion. It's good It's good for the garden, but hopefully it's good if it can just isolate and garden and nothing else. Not too much so that it floods. Um, but yeah, it's been, yeah, there's, there's not a lot you can do really. Like, especially like retaining walls like you do, like you, if you dig a hole, then it gets filled up with water. Then you've got to pump the water out because you can't just leave it in there. And then you've usually got to clean out the slurry out of it as well. So it's structurally sound. So, yeah, it's been, it's been tough. There's not much. you just got to, you know, put one foot in front of the other and keep going and realise that it's not going to last forever. So you, you will lose money on some jobs. Um, and what my, my um, point of view to it is, you know, if, I'm not going to ask clients for money because we're – you know, got rained on or I didn't allow enough for something um, because I'm also not going to give it to them if we do it quicker than what I planned. So you can't you can't ask for more money because you didn't allow for something but then not give them money if you, you know, make a good profit. So that's that's my, that's just sort of karma anyway. It's swings and roundabouts. You win some, you lose some. But hopefully you win more than you lose. And the best experiences uh, the best the best learning um the best way of learning things is by paying for it i find because if you make a mistake and you don't have to pay for it it doesn't hurt you as much as if you have to pay for it so yeah that's what i've done but yeah been it's been struggling um a fair bit and how we certainly with cash flow but um but hopefully we're on the right on the right uh, track now and then it will start going well, and then the garden dry comes up, and then the money goes out again. So, yeah, certainly uh, reach out to like me or anyone else if you if you're struggling and you want someone to talk to. Okay. But yeah, definitely, no one's alone if they're struggling. Certainly this year, and like even and it's no, it's not anything to do with the lack of work. Everyone's got, well, not everyone, but most people have got a ton of work. But being busy doesn't mean you're making money. Because for that exact reason, it rains. You still you lose a day and you're still busy, but you losing the day just compounds all the other jobs back into the other one. And so yeah, definitely, definitely a struggle. And um, and that's been a good thing about the podcast is hearing other people say the same thing about how hard it's been and and, and people who are listening and realizing that yeah, they feel exactly the same. Uh, this one is from Neil from Terrain Landscape. Is there something you put into every day? Is there something you put into every design, like a, a signature piece? So there's nothing that I'm doing yet, but um, my first boss I worked for, he's put in a, I can't remember the particular, it was like a succulent, and I think it was called a money plant. I don't know the exact, I don't, it wasn't jade, but it was some succulent that he would put near the front door on every, every garden, which was a bit weird because not every garden calls for that. And it wasn't it wasn't in style garden doing that. Um so yeah, so he did that on every job to bring luck to the to the client. But I don't do anything to that extreme, but um I've got probably a uh, a signature style which I'm wanting to push when, but only when it's appropriate. So like I like using green, white and grey combination. So um yeah, you know, all different shades of green for the plants, white in the flowers and the you know, like timbers, and then grey for the paving. So that's why we're using the that crazy paving and the Pietro Grigio from Granny Works that I was talking about. So that's something I'm wanting to do because I love the look of it. Like that's how what my place will look like. I'm um, using concrete as well. So like using plain concrete is a really nice. It's like a mix between white and grey, and um, like you don't necessarily need to use white oxide and concrete to make it look white because it sort of naturally is that colour anyway. 
Um, so that's something I'll be doing. Um, but it's yeah, you got you take it takes years to build that kind of style and you know, reputation and signature. So you'll you'll see it on a few projects, and those ones I'll be pushing a lot more than others because, like I've said a few times, you want to be um, you want to put out what you want to do more of. So I'll be doing doing that. But in saying that, I like to be a bit different as well. I'm doing a native design at the moment, which is pretty cool. Like I love doing that as well. Haven't done a lot of them in the past, but you know, but they're pretty cool. The amount of like the amount of different plants you can use to not look native as well. So yeah, that's gonna be even fun. But but yeah, definitely like the the classic kind of look, the green, white and grey, cool grey look. Um, so that was the last question I had. So thank you very much to everyone who um, asked one in the lead up and also during the you know, this live. So I'll probably do. I'll probably. So I hope I'll be doing one of these each week every Sunday night at eight thirty on Instagram Live, Instagram on the Instyle Gardens account. And what I'll do is put out a question box probably on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and then again on the Friday, and I'll just keep a record of um, all the questions that get asked. And, answer them on the Sunday and if I miss one I'll just chuck it on for the next week um, but if you have a question without the question box like some people have done feel free to shoot me a message and I'll I'll add it, I'll add it on here and also you, some, most of the time I'll answer your questions straight away as well as well as reading it out here um, but thank you very much for, for joining me again and we'll see you in the next one